Welcome to our worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. The hymn which ends the service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 50. Realising that their father, Jacob, was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God, of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The Gospel reading is Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison, until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their lord all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his lord handed him over to be tortured, until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. There aren't that many Bible stories that seem to be really familiar to people who don't come to church these days. Even those who do come to church are often a bit hazy. The birth of Jesus, Noah's Ark perhaps, but the story we heard part of in our first reading 
often lurks at least on the edge of people's consciousness, and that's mainly thanks to Andrew Lloyd Webber. It's the tail end of the story of Joseph, of Technicolor Dreamcoat fame, and his highly dysfunctional family. Joseph is the favourite of his father's twelve sons. The special coat he gives him is a sign of that, but it turns out to be a very unwise gift. Infuriated by the way their father treats Joseph, his jealous brothers sell him into slavery, telling his father that he's been killed by wild animals. They present him with that dream coat, torn and bloodied, as proof. But many years later, to their horror, they come face to face with Joseph in Egypt, where they've come to try to find food during a famine. Far from sinking into obscurity or being worked to death as a slave, he has, by the help of God, risen to become Pharaoh's right-hand man, the controller of the food supplies they're hoping to buy. They don't recognise Joseph at first. He eventually reveals himself to them, but only after he's made them bring his beloved younger brother, Benjamin, down to Egypt so that Joseph knows he's safe. After all, if they'd try to dispose of one brother, who's to say they won't do the same to another one too? The revelation that this Egyptian bigwig is Joseph terrifies his brothers, but much to their surprise, he welcomes and forgives them. It seems like a happy ending, but there's a sting in the tale, and the passage we heard today reveals it. Even after that initial reunion, the wounds still run deep in Joseph's brothers. It's hard carrying around such a load of guilt, their awful shared secret year after year, decade after decade. Surely, they think, sooner or later, Joseph will want to even the score and get his own back. When Jacob, their father, dies all those old anxieties resurface. Joseph's brothers insist that Jacob had told them on his deathbed to tell Joseph to forgive them. In fact, if you look at the text, you find this wasn't so at all. It's just another bit of manoeuvring from this manipulative bunch of men. They can't believe that they really have been forgiven, that they are safe. Their fear gets in the way. They know they wouldn't have forgiven themselves if they'd been in Joseph's place. But Joseph names their fear and reassures them. Have no fear, he says. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, we're told, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Forgiveness is rarely straightforward. It often takes a long time. And it doesn't necessarily look the way we think it will. A slate wiped clean, a happy ending. As I said last week, love and the forgiveness that's part of love doesn't mean that we should put ourselves or others in harm's way. Joseph doesn't forgive his brothers until Benjamin has been brought to him because he needs to know that he's safe first. Forgiving someone doesn't necessarily mean we have to be close to them either. Nor does it mean we'll suddenly feel all warm towards them. Forgiveness isn't an emotion. It's an action, a decision, a commitment to act for the good of others. Genuine forgiveness sets people free rather than shackling them to us emotionally, and therefore it sets us free too. It allows others to grow and change, and we can then grow and change as well. Forgiveness means not letting what went wrong between us define the rest of our lives or theirs. Of course, it's much easier to talk about than it is to do. And it's especially hard to give others that space to grow and to be if we've never really experienced it for ourselves. 
Through all the terrible ups and downs of his life, Joseph has learned to trust in the generous love of God. He's had to, because he hasn't had the power to help himself. He's discovered that God is with him wherever he is, even in a prison cell with his life in danger. He knows he's safe in God's hands, and that enables him to be generous with his brothers in a way they can't even imagine. Generosity is an essential part of forgiveness. After all, it's a word with give right there in the middle of it. But we can't give what we haven't received. And Joseph's brothers don't ever seem to have known or let themselves know what it feels like to be securely loved. They grasp and manipulate, as if it's all down to them to ensure their place in the world. They play games, often very dangerous ones. They're constantly calculating the odds instead of trusting and being open. There's an attempt at calculation going on in the Gospel reading too. How many times should I forgive? asks Peter. Seven times? No, seventy-seven times, says Jesus. Some translations read seventy times seven, which is even bigger. Either way, though, the point is that the number is too big to keep track of. If you tried, you'd soon find you couldn't remember whether this was actually the 37th or 38th time you'd forgiven, and you'd soon have to go back to the beginning and start again. So, Jesus is saying, don't even try to keep track. Just be generous with one another, as God is generous to you. The story he tells is an exploration of that. When we forgive, it's like cancelling a debt that we've come to realise will always be unpayable. If someone's hurt us, there's no way they can wind back time and unhurt us again. Words that have been said can't be unsaid. When someone cuts us, there's always going to be a scar, however well it heals. However much we punish others, that won't change. When the king in the story Jesus tells forgives the first man's debt, which is unimaginably huge, he knows there's a cost to him. He's lost that money, a lot of money, and he'll never get it back. But he decides that the future is more important than the past. The tragedy is that the man he's forgiven doesn't understand or value the gift that he's been given. Perhaps he tells himself that it's, own, it's his own cleverness that's persuaded the king to let him off. Thinking like that puts him back in control of the situation, which in reality he isn't. Maybe throwing his weight around with his fellow slave who owes him money, a far smaller amount, helps him bolster his sense of power after the humiliation of having to plead for his life. But the king isn't impressed, and the result is that he's re-arrested and, after all, condemned to be tortured until his debt is paid, which will be never since it's so huge. I don't think, by the way, that we need to take this literally as a picture of God. Parables aren't meant to be read like that. But it reminds us of what happens when resentment, fear lack of trust take hold of us. We suffer just as much, if not more, than the person we fail to forgive. The stories we've heard today are tough ones to get our heads around. They challenge us to forgive, but also, and perhaps more importantly, they challenge us to ask ourselves whether we know that we've been forgiven, whether we are loved and secure. They challenge us to step out of that world of don't get mad, get even, and to accept that some debts will always be unpayable, including our own. That we, like Joseph, need to learn to draw on the inexhaustible love of God so that we can find the healing and the hope we need, and the healing and the hope he wants us to share with those around us too. Amen.
And so as we bring our prayers to God, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen.